Welcome back to Football Oasis. Today we are joined by a very special guest, and that is Jason Davidson, the Socceroo left back. And we also have a co-host with us today, and that is Neil from the Round Ball Project. If you haven't heard of him before, make sure you go down below in the description and have a look at his latest podcast. He does footballing related interviews, and I assure you, they are great quality. And without further ado, let's get to the interview. Jason Davidson. From Ulsan Hyundai. Hey guys, thanks for having me. How is the lockdown period at the moment in Korea? Um, it's actually not too bad now. Back to a bit of normality. Um, obviously, the K-League's up and running. People um, kind of gone back to normal. Still a bit cautious when we go outside. Everyone's wearing masks. Um, but yeah, definitely heading in the right direction. Have a deep dive into your career. Uh, so, all the way from the start at Hume City. So, obviously, getting that first move overseas what were the adjustments like for yourself so obviously i um i went to japan when i was younger um, through the academy then i um, came back to hume for about six months played in the vpl back then um and then i played six months and then went over to, to portugal so it was obviously a, i think coming back to australia for that six months was a bit of adjustment because coming from academy mainly playing against kids and then coming and playing against men um, was a bit of an adjustment. Um, but I think it taught me and uh, gave me that opportunity to play against adults and strengthen me up a little bit to prepare for my European adventure. The, the second question that we wanted to ask you, Jace, is obviously you've had some memorable moments in, in your career so far, obviously such as the Asian Cup in 2015, winning the Slovenian League and the Cup in 2018. What would you say is the most feel-good moment in your career? Yeah, it's it's a tough one. Um, there's definitely a few things, a uh, couple that you've mentioned. Or also, you know, representing your country at a World Cup, mm. um, playing in the Prem was always a dream of mine as a youngster. It's hard, but I think if if, if you look at it, um, for me. I think winning a, a Australia's first trophy, a major trophy uh, in men's football, yeah. especially in Australia on home soil, um, the way we did it in front of so many, you know, fans and in front of your family, I think probably that's got to top um, all of it off. It's just something crazy. Um, it's hard to explain in words the the build up throughout the tournament, and then obviously, you know, to to play a final in front of. 80 odd thousand fans, the whole country behind you. Um, even if you followed football, you didn't, it kind of that atmosphere because it was in Australia to have the whole kind of, kind of country just zone in for that particular time, that tournament. Um, and then to be able to win it the way we did going into extra time and yeah, just all that emotions and to do it in front of family and friends was, you know, something very, very special. Yeah, and I'm getting flashbacks now of, of watching that with the family and stuff. That was such a good moment. <laughs> like, when Charisi put that in, oh, the elation just is unbelievable. Right. Like I've got, I'm looking at my Asian Cup ticket now from the first game against Kuwait. Um, it was, uh, it well, was crazy because like just... if you if you remember the goal, um, the I think it was uh, I can't remember oh, uh, Tommy Tommy Juric, um yeah. put it through the guy's legs and then he we yeah. locked eyes. So he was actually trying to cross to me because I saw him. Um, we locked eyes, but what happened was, if you remember, the goalkeeper touched it when he was crossing the last second. And when oh, he yeah, that's right. I, I thought, oh, my God, I just hope it goes to one of the boys, like, because, you know, um, it obviously was going away from me. And uh, for, fortunately enough, Jimmy put it um, in the back of the net and sealed it for us. You know, another poignant moment for me was the 2014 World Cup. Obviously, you know, some <laughs> very memorable moments there. Tim Chaos volley. And ultimately, you know, you had, you had a very positive showing. What was it like to be in that camp and, you know, with the boys and with so many wonderful players and just playing on the world's biggest stage? Yeah, I think if you look at that particular World Cup, um, it was quite unique. Uh, firstly, because it was probably one of the World Cups that we've gone. And just before the tournament, obviously having a new head coach kind of brought in a lot of um, younger players, probably inexperienced players at the time. Um, and it was it was kind of getting thrown in the deep end a little bit because the actual players that kind of call it like the older generation, especially you know people like Lucas Neal, Marx, well these guys that had done all the qualifications and then right at the end kind of everything kind of chopped and changed and uh, 
we were fortunate enough, like players like myself, uh, you know, Matthew Lecky, Matty Ryan, that were just kind of breaking in, kind of was given that opportunity to go to World Cup when we kind of not necessarily earned that right, but we were given that right. Uh, we got given that opportunity. Um, so it was it was a it was an unbelievable experience, you know, to, especially to play in a World Cup that was in South America, you know, where football was a religion. Um, crazy, uh, crazy fans. How the passionate the the fans are, um, and to be in camp, it was, it was fun to be honest because we were just we were a bunch of kids pretty much. A lot of us younger, coming through. Um, I think we were fearless because we just we had nothing to lose. Kind of just wanted to go out there and enjoy the the situation, the and just play. Um, and we had a, a good balance because we had some, you know, players that have gone, we had gone through that, you know, we had leaders in the team. You had Bresh, you had Timmy, um, you know, other players there that as well, uh, Milzy, uh, Mille. You had some players, Matty Mackay, you know, just to mention a few that had experienced that. So we had a good balance between uh, younger and, you know, experienced players. And um, we had a good, we had a good atmosphere in the group. Um, and it was enjoyable because, um, it's not easy to go away for a long period of time to be stuck with the same kind of uh, people day in, day out. And if you don't have that chemistry, it can be quite difficult. But for us, it was it was very easy. Uh, we were all there to, you know, represent our country to the best we could. Um, and for me, the best part of it was just the just to, to play against the world's best and the whole world watching. Um, I remember the first game against Chile when the national anthem went. It was just unbelievable to just to, to see how loud, like the atmosphere in that stadium is probably one of the best um, atmospheres I've played in. It was just it was crazy how enthusiastic even and even the Australian supporters like it's just a totally different feeling to a national team game or an Asian Cup tour when it's a World Cup because everyone becomes a fan and everyone you know tunes in for that. That that would have been sick, man. I can't like as a as a fan growing up to watch football. I can't imagine, you know, going out to step out on a professional pitch, let alone playing at a World Cup, man. So that you've got some stories there for the grandkids one day, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's crazy. Um, Jason, I wanted to get your opinion on what it would take for an Australian um, player to succeed within the Premier League and, and do well. Obviously, we have great examples right now with Aaron Moy and um, Matty Ryan over there. But in your sort of opinion, obviously, having played at West Brom, um, what was your experience there and what would you recommend for someone potentially being in that situation in a few years or so? Firstly, uh, for me in particular, in my situation, I think it was a bit tough. Um, it was maybe the, and I've, I've said this previously, I think it might have been the wrong move looking back at it, um, going to the Premier League. Um, just purely and simply because it just wasn't my type, my type of football. Um, so for me, in my personal case, um, you know, it's a, it's a tough league. Obviously, it's the biggest league, one of the biggest. Oh, it is the biggest league in the world. Television, it's broadcasted everywhere. It's the it's the league that all the superstars go to, big money. Um, but it, it's a, it's a tough one. Like I said, for me, it was always a dream to play in the Premier League. Um, but to to be there, it's the best way I can explain it for you know, especially for young Aussies. Um, that want to uh, accomplish that dream is it's brutal over there. You know, it's um, day in, day out. You've got to be the best. You've got to be the best at all times uh, mm -hmm. competition because the money is so um, is big over there. It's so easy to, you know, if you're not performing just to, to cut you and, and get someone else that is going to perform. And um, for me, the biggest thing, the biggest hurdle that I found it was hard I was kind of used to you know European football um, especially playing in Holland like it's Saturday to Saturday week week by week you know you got time to rest recover whereas in England the games just come week every couple of days you got cups here cups there trainings high intensity it's raining the pitches are heavy um, and I found the recovery the recovery period um, very, very difficult to, to handle um, because uh, 
my body just wasn't used to it. I, I think I, I went there at, I think I was 22 uh, or maybe just early, at, just turned 23. And um, when I looked at, I remember looking at the, the younger boys that are 15, 16 year olds, like in the academy and their legs were double my size. And that's because from a young age, they're just always in the gym they, and they've prepared their bodies. Whereas, you know, coming from overseas, um, I wasn't used to that physicality, um, that physical, you know, direct football. Um, so yeah, I found that, a bit hard so for me my best advice um probably is to to make sure you know for young boys are on a technical side take the technical side away from it you definitely need to prepare your body to be able to you know handle that physicality i, I know there's a whole lot of thing about the work permits and whatnot in order to get into the premier league so i guess do you believe why a lot of not a lot of australians are currently playing in the premier league is partly due to this like work permit situation and just how hard it is for people to get into academies, let alone clubs in general? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think yes and no, because I am a believer that if you're, if you're good enough, you'll, there's always a way to, to find a way. Um, so is it harder for Australians? Definitely. We're obviously on the other side of the world. Um, millions, millions of kids around the world have the same dream playing the world, in the Premier League. So what makes an Australian different to someone that's from anywhere else in the world? They've got the same issues about work permits. Um, so, yeah, it is tough, but I do believe, you know, if you're good enough, um, the clubs will find a way. Um, and that's from junior right through to, you know, to the, the top team, the first team. Fast track a little bit. Obviously, you had the uh, head spells at Huddersfield and back to Groningen. Um, and obviously, you had a spell as well uh, in Croatia. Uh, and now you come back to Australia, now playing for the Perth Glory with uh, a formidable coach in Tony Popovich. Uh, yeah. What was it like being coached by Tony? And would you say he's one of the best coaches you've had uh, within your career thus far? Yeah, he's definitely um, one of the, the best coaches I've had. Um, I've been fortunate to, enough to work with a lot of high-quality coaches, um, coaches that have had, you know, or are having big careers. You know, I've worked also uh, with with Ange, um, who I, I rate really highly. Um, so yeah, he's definitely one of the best coaches that I, I've worked with. Um, and he's, I think everyone kind of knows his uh, philosophies and how he what what he expects from his players. Um, so for me, it was something very different to what I've I've had in the past. Um, but I thrived under that kind of. Uh, dictatorship if you want to kind of put it in the regime he's, and I've said this he's he's the top dog and um, everyone had to fall into place and he expects you to to deliver day in day out um, not just on the football pitch but off the football pitch you need to live fully focused about being a professional athlete um, and he expects the highest standards from all his players um, so for me I think coming back from Europe um it was definitely something I thought I needed at, at my particular time in my career. Um, and, you know, it was one of the best decisions I ever made coming back and working under him because he gave me that uh, springboard, uh, that platform to, to be able to get my body back into shape um, and to perform um, and gave me that opportunity to, to come back overseas and into South Korea. Now. Uh, there's rumours <laughs> recently that he might be coming to Melbourne victory. Uh, do you think that may be realistic? <laughs> I, I I heard. I'm sorry to interrupt. I heard like Tony Pinard. was like uh, I, I don't pronounce his last name. He's just like, like yeah. completely refuted. as like if Anthony Di Pietro was like either mates. So they, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, I saw the news as well. Um, yeah, you know, if if that's something, <laughs> uh, or if that's something that he was interested in, I'm sure you know, he's a very um, detailed person and character. So he will obviously look at everything and. In the world of football, rumours come thick and thin. So, um, <laughs> for me, obviously, coming from Melbourne as well, I definitely want to play at least one time in my career in uh, in Melbourne, in my hometown. Um, yeah. So, that's something that I, you know, I would love to do um, once in my career. Um, when that is, you never know in football, you know. It could be, that's, it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy one because at the end of the day, with football, you never know where you're going to be tomorrow or, it depends on the performances, but um, we'll see what the future holds. Yeah, maybe you'll be playing with uh, Papa in uh, in <laughs> victory, mate. <laughs> <Melbourne>. <laughs>
Could, One it day could be for time. West United as well. It could be for any team. Nah, Melbourne's nah. a very big city. So. <laughs> <laughs> Melbourne's um, a big city and uh, yeah, there's three teams there, I think. So. There is, correct. Yeah. correct. We'll focus a little bit on the A-League now. And I wanted to ask you, obviously you played 28 games for Perth Glory in the 18-19 season. Um, in terms of the A-League overall, do you feel like the A-League is progressing? It's a bit hard for me to answer that just purely and simply because I've only I was really only there for ten months really. So I can only speak about the time that I've been there. So I can't really compare it to previous seasons or this season. Um I can only speak about that particular um season. Um for me, uh I think people underestimate the quality that the A League has. Um I know it's hard when, you know, People watch the Prem or European football. Sometimes they think, oh, European football, that's the, destina- des- that's the destination that you have to go. And, you know, Australia's this or that. Um, but it's definitely a league that if I think if you come back to or you try to, you know, establish yourself, if you don't take it serious, um, you can be left behind. Um, it's um, That was the biggest focus for me coming back. I knew I had to make sure I didn't underestimate the quality um, because at the end of the day, um, it's a, it's a, it's the top league in Australia. It's a professional league, um, professional players. I think it's um, with the foreigners that have come over, it's kind of been hit and miss because I think sometimes it's a, it's hard to find a foreigner that wants to come over and actually perform, not just come over and come for the good lifestyle and maybe towards the end of his career and just come to enjoy and, and pick up a paycheck. So um, it's it's a tough one, but I think. Uh, the A-League has um, grown uh, in the right direction from the start. Uh, It's gotten bigger, more teams have come involved. Um, I know it's going through tough times at the moment, financially and with the TV rights and everyone, and with obviously this COVID-19. But it's just important for Australian football that we, you know, we stick together and we find a way to make, you know, football grow. Um, If And that's, you know, supporting the A-League, supporting the teams and making sure we can try and find the right mo- model that works for Australian football. And I guess I'd just like to add, um, obviously making the A-League Grand Final playing against Sydney FC at, you know, such a big stadium at uh, Optus Stadium in, uh, in Perth, you know, describe that sort of atmosphere. Like, comp- I mean, you played at World Cups, you played at um, an Asia Cup final, you've done all these wonderful things, but uh, how does the A-League Grand Final sort of match against those? Totally different, I guess. Um, but I have to say, um, when you look when you look at it, I think fifty five thousand people came to the game. Um, unbelievable stadium. I think it's one of probably one of my favorites in um, in Australia. It's a modern stadium. Um, and because it's quite far from everywhere else in Australia, it was pretty much all Perth glory fans. so it was it was an unbelievable experience. Um, we were quite fortunate enough. I think we played Chelsea in a preseason game before that, and it was the kind yeah. of same thing, like to have uh, yeah. to play in that stadium. And in the grand final, it was it was a fantastic experience, um, and it goes to show the the um, potential Australian football has, you know, because grand final fifty five thousand people sold out in Perth, um, and it was a great match. Um, unfortunately, we uh, didn't get the result we wanted. Um, but it just shows you the potential that Australian football has because when the quality is there and when the uh, people want to get behind it, you know, they'll, they'll come and, and support their team. And, you know, that's I, I'm very grateful and I enjoyed my time there because I really felt that connection with the Perth Glory fans. I thought, you know, they were fantastic. Yeah. Even when we played in Melbourne in the away section, it was always for away games or home games. Yeah. You kind of had that connection with the shared and other people as well because... Uh, you know, they, were, they were enjoyed the season. They really got behind us. And obviously, uh, you uh, left the glory. Uh, following that season, now you moved to Korea with uh, Ulsan Hyundai. Uh, yeah. Very nice win uh, the other day. Um, I Thank add, you. I saw some highlights. So she's so intense. Um, you know, within the K-League, what is life like over in Korea compared to Australia? Obviously, two vastly different countries. But, um, like, what's like the day-to-day life compared to Australia? Totally different, um, obviously. Um, being an Australian and living back home in Australia, you know, very relaxed, um, different lifestyle. 
Um, it's a bit more hustle and bustle here. Um, I, will, I think it's 55 million population compared to um, Australia, where you know every, Australia is so big and everything spread, so it's very relaxed. We're here, it's you know a lot of apartments, so everything's kind of like dense. Everything's um, you, it's very crowded. Um, so very different lifestyle. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have lived in Japan when I was younger, so I kind of knew what I was heading to and exp what what to expect with the culture. Um, and from the football side, you know, I'm really enjoying my time because uh, I've come to a fantastic club, um, very well structured um, and very ambitious club. Um, and we've got a good infrastructure at the club, so it makes it a lot more enjoyable coming to a country where, you know, you come into a club that's very organized, very ambitious, set targets that we wanted to accomplish and to be a part of something like that, very professional setup. Um, you know, it makes it a lot more easier coming over here. You've played in a lot of different places, Jason, but I just wanted to highlight something um, about the A-League. Just to, yeah. obviously being born in Australia, you want to see football in the country grow to the best or the, the potential yeah. that it it's there to reach. So I just wanted to ask you, do you think in terms of the marquees, um, there is a need to minimise the number of marquees in each team or should that be the same or increase it? You know, because as you mentioned, there's a lot of players who just come wanting that paycheck to wind down their career sort of thing. Um, so, so how do you feel about that particular situation? You've got to take each player um, differently, you know, because, for example, I played with uh, Diego Castro, and uh, he's someone that, you know, has come over and he's a lot older and, you know, he's played at the highest level, for example. But he, you know, he performs in the A-League and you can see that passion and the desire that he wants to keep, you know, performing and playing well. So he's a foreigner that's come over and he's done the business and continues to work hard to be the best he can be week in, week out. Um, so I think it's a bit unfair to say and put everyone in that kind of same bracket sure. and say, oh, every foreigner that comes yeah. over sure. um, is just coming for a paycheck. Uh, yes, there has been players like that, but I think, like I said with Diego, for someone that I've personally been with, um, I can say that, you know, there has been good um, circumstances that it has worked out well. Uh, even at uh, uh, Ola Toyhoven that I um, played against last year, I thought he was a fantastic asset for victory, someone that, you know, um, in that particular year, he did really well. And he bought quality and made the standard go higher. Um, so it, it, I think it's got a, it's, it's a double-edged sword, but I think with what has to be done with the, the foreigner, my opinion is, is that you've got to look into look into detail and not just the where's he played, how big is his profile. You need to look at the person as well and see, is he a, a player that wants to be hungry and wants to contribute and come over to Australia because he wants to, you know, still play at a high level or is he that type of, you know, you need to do a bit more homework, I think, in seeing what the personality is as well, not just go for the name, where's he played, is he going to bring, you know, fans in or, you know, look at that as well because, at the end of the day, when you look at marquee, it's like here in Asia, for example, when you bring in foreigners, they're expected to be the best players on the pitch. That's why they get paid the most. And that has to be no different with the A-League. The players that are coming in from overseas are earning more. Usually that's the case. And they have to back it up. And if they don't, um, then you have to look at the situation and say, you know, why is that? Or are we doing the right scouting? Are we um, following the right process? And... Uh, I think if we can find that kind of quality foreigner kind of player, um, then maybe you can increase the number to bring the level up. Um, because I think the biggest issue with this, uh, because there's um, maybe not as many numbers, the, what's the, what's the word? The, there is a lot of players at an early age that are playing for numerous clubs and they're just, if they're not working out another one, they'll go to another and circulating around the league. So if mm. you can find, uh, you know, the next generation of players in, the, in maybe the NPLs around the country or bring maybe one or two more foreigners or good quality foreigners that are, maybe don't have the biggest name, but they're, you know, hungry to, to play well and use maybe the league as a, pl a platform to go to another league, then that can help build the game and bring the quality you know, higher. I guess it sort of feeds into the argument of the salary cap and 
you see teams like the classic argument, oh, Central Coast Mariners finish last every season or every other, every other season. You know, they should just, um, you know, what's the point of salary cap if they're just going to be, you know, finishing last? Do, do you sort of believe that we should abolish the salary cap? Um, and especially during this COVID-19 crisis, with the finances obviously going to be very more, very much more like reduced. Uh, where do you, where do you think the whole debate surrounding this should head to, towards? I think at the end of the day, it all comes down to one thing, and that's not Australian, not just for Australian football. I think every every football club in the world, it all comes down to to money. It's, it's simple as that. So, um, I know people are saying, "Oh, we should get rid of the salary cap," but you've got to look at what is the solution. Um, I know that. There's obviously richer everywhere in the world. You have richer clubs and clubs that are, don't have as much money, and then you create that kind of gap where you have your Real Madrid's, Barcelona's, for example, in La Liga, and then you have your lower teams. And I think the reason reasoning behind the salary cap maybe is so we don't create that that the competition stays a bit more closer between clubs. Um, but it's it's a tough one. Um, I think the clubs are spending what they have, and um, Okay. Yes, you. Let's say you do release. Uh, you make it a free for all, and you can spend whatever you want. Um, if the club doesn't have the money to spend, where are they going to get the money? Or you know, they're they're spending what they can. Um, so, yeah, it, it's a tough one for me. I uh, I haven't played in the A League long enough to to give an opinion that I think that you know I'll find a solution. Um, for me, it's yeah, it's a it's a very tough one. Um, I can understand both sides. I can understand why the salary cap is there. In pre- I know it's there to also protect the clubs from not overspending and putting themselves in a situation that um, you know they could go bankrupt. And then I can see the other side as well, where maybe the bigger clubs that have a, maybe a better infrastructure want to spend more money because they have the resources to, um, but aren't allowed to. So. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. Having watched the state of football uh, discussion, do you believe that it's actually feasible for Australia to implement a second division? And what clubs, in in your perspective, do you think would succeed in that area if they were promoted to that? With the second division, um, our biggest, I think, the biggest setback for Australian football is how big our country is. Yeah, so 100%. Yeah. it's very costly to for teams to travel around Australia. So you, you can't compare the model of, let's say, the A-League to K-League, for example, because they don't have the, the costs of flying around, um, travelling. Um, so it's a totally different kettle of fish and it's so hard to to say, oh, listen, let's make a second division. Well, there's teams, there's so many teams out there that want to be, but mm-hmm. you've got to look at the financial side as well. And are they able to maintain that even... We're just talking about A-League clubs. It's very difficult for them to maintain that yearly. And um, you mentioned before about Central Coast, about every year, about just making, you know, the wooden spoon or financially they don't, um, they're struggling to, to maintain that. So you can open the doors up for a second division, um, but will they financially have the money to back that up? Maybe they do for a year or two, but in the long term, do they, you know, have they got the infrastructure to, to do that? Um, it's easy to have all these plans and all easy to have these ideas. Um, but I think, yeah, the biggest setback is how big Australia is. Um, I did see, I actually didn't watch the um, the podcast, but I did see something on Instagram. I think uh, Swarty uh, yeah. on Optus. They were having a chat. It was really yeah, interesting. They had, a, they had a chat about it and I'm not, I didn't, watch the whole thing but I did see something about having regional um, yeah. kind of second division idea um, I think something like that makes a lot more sense than having a purely second division like a second A league yeah. into a national one I think maybe a regional one would make that travel of costs a bit more easier on the teams and then maybe somehow have you know a playoff kind of mm. set up um, I'm not too sure but I think the sole focus for Australian football is to get the, the A-League, making sure that model um, is set up, working well financially. You know, teams are, are making money and doing well. And then um, 
focusing on, you know, the lower divisions. Um, Any clubs that you, you'd like to see in there? Move, move into the A-League even? Coming from Melbourne, my dad obviously playing, um, you know, you got clubs with a lot of history, Melbourne Knights, South Melbourne, um, you know, I think probably South Melbourne, South Melbourne has a good infrastructure, um, a good fan base, good stadium. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's tough because I don't know, it, um, I know that there's been talk that they've been trying to get an A-League licence, I know that they've been trying to get one um, but like I said, at the end of the day, it comes down to money, really. Um, yeah. Are they yeah, fine there? Li- license yeah. fees of up to like $19 million per per, per team. Yeah. Sometimes, like, so, not, not even the best sides get in, not even the best bids get in the in the A-League. It's just like, which, which is more financially backed. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I definitely would like to see a Melbourne team. Like I said, maybe, you know, I think South Melbourne would be one of the ones that have, have done, you know, had a big history as well. So maybe they're, they're, um, they're a club that maybe I would like to see there. Um, but, yeah, I think I think it's not around the corner. I, th- I still think that there needs, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a few years away from that. Uh, in the Asian Champions League, uh, you've seen so many Australian clubs just fail and fail and fail by that one miracle job by uh, Popper um, in 2014. Uh, but why, why don't you think these, these Australian clubs can compete against, um, well, China's understandable, that the money there is unbelievable, but many consider the A-League and the K-League to be on a fairly similar playing level. But uh, yeah. what do you think really makes it hard for uh, the clubs like Victory Sydney um, and Perth in more recent times, unable to sort of progress to the knockout stages of the Asian Champions League? I think it's important to, to say something um, in with what one, one thing that you said was about people thinking that the A-League and K-League are there, thereabouts um, similar. I've played in both and I can definitely tell you it's a bit naive to think that purely and simply, I'm not talking about a football perspective, but from a financial side, I can speak about my club here and like it comes back to the same issue, it money. Um, you know, our mate, our owner is Hyundai, so it's a multi-billion-dollar company. Um, and if you look at our squad, our squad, I was actually talking to one of my friends about this the other day. We've got international or current or ex-international South Korean national team players that are sitting on the bench and not even making the squad. That's how big our depth is. We've got 22, 23 players. Um, that can be starting 11 players in Australia because of the salary cap, you'd be like, it depends how you structure your team. You might have a, a fantastic starting 11 and then maybe younger players that are earning less in the squad or you spread it out, for example, and then you might have 14 players. So the depth is totally different. It's not possible to have um, 22 players in the A-League that are high quality players yeah. that could be in the starting level, just purely and simply because of the salary cap. Whereas in Korea, for example, if you want to splash the money, they can because they have the money too. And if they want to no, go... Is there, all, is there no like salary cap there? I'm not, I'm not too familiar with the sort of... No, kind of there's no financial salary. Structure. There's, no, there's no salary. There's no salary cap. So um, I can speak about Usan. And for example, we've got... We've got every position is doubled up. And some positions are doubled up with national team players. So when you look at that and you look at the Asian Champions League, for example, um, because you're traveling so much, you've got so many games in the league and then you've got to travel as well. To do well in so many competitions, you need to have depth. That's just normal. That's part and parcel of football. That's the same in Europe as well um, with the cups and stuff like that. So depth is a key thing to doing well, um, I think, in international competitions. Um, because you never know when injuries come and this, that. So I think the biggest hurdle for Australians and why maybe it's difficult um, in ACL is because of the depth. And if you look at when, I think, when Popper won the Champions League, he kind of was, and what I've heard and spoken to some of my play, uh, teammates that were in that squad, is he was playing a totally different team in the yeah. A-League and in the Champions League. He was going back and forth because that was the yeah. only way he could do was balancing that out. Whereas, for example, our team, for example, in the K-League, when you have so many players in depth, it's quite easy to do that because 
You know what I mean? You've got so many players. Yeah, so for yeah. an A-League team to do that regularly, um, it's hard. Difficult. It's difficult. Respect. Yeah.